Chapter 16 of Candide by Voltaire, translated by Philip Littell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Adventures of the Two Travelers with Two Girls, Two Monkeys, and the Savages Called O'Rylons. Candide and his valet had got beyond the barrier before it was known in the camp that the German Jesuit was dead. The weary Cacambo had taken care to fill his wallet with bread, chocolate, bacon, fruit, and a few bottles of wine. With their Andalusian horses they penetrated into an unknown country, where they perceived no beaten track. At length they came to a beautiful meadow intersected with purling rills. Here our two adventurers fed their horses. Cacambo proposed to his master to take some food, and he set him an example. "'How can you ask me to eat ham?' said Candide. "'After killing the baron's son, and being doomed never more to see the beautiful Conagonda, what will it avail me to spin out my wretched days, and drag them far from her in remorse and despair? And what will the journal of Trevoux say?' While he was thus lamenting his fate, he went on eating. The sun went down. The two wanderers heard some little cries which seemed to be uttered by women. They did not know whether they were cries of pain or joy, but they started up precipitately with that inquietude and alarm which every little thing inspires in an unknown country. The noise was made by two naked girls, who tripped along the mead while two monkeys were pursuing them and biting their buttocks. Candide was moved with pity. He had learned to fire a gun in the Bulgarian service, and he was so clever at it that he could hit a filbert in a hedge without touching a leaf of the tree. He took up his double-barreled Spanish fusil, let it off, and killed the two monkeys. "'God be praised!' my dear cacambo i have rescued those two poor creatures from a most perilous situation if i have committed a sin in killing an inquisitor and a jesuit i have made ample amends by saving the lives of these girls perhaps they are young ladies of family and this adventure may procure us great advantages in this country he was continuing but stopped short when he saw the two girls tenderly embracing the monkeys, bathing their bodies in tears, and rending the air with the most dismal lamentations. "'Little did I expect to see such good nature,' said he at length to Cacambo, who made answer. "'Master, you have done a fine thing now. You have slain the sweethearts of those two young ladies.' "'The sweethearts?' is it possible you are jesting cacambo i can never believe it dear master replied cacambo you are surprised at everything why should you think it so strange that in some countries there are monkeys which insinuate themselves into the good graces of the ladies they are a fourth part human as i am a fourth part spaniard alas replied candide I remember to have heard Master Pangloss say that formerly such accidents used to happen, that these mixtures were productive of centaurs, fauns, and satyrs, and that many of the ancients had seen such monsters, but I looked upon the whole as fabulous. "'You ought now to be convinced,' said Cacambo, "'that it is the truth, and you see what use is made of those creatures.' by persons that have not had a proper education all i fear is that those ladies will play us some ugly trick these sound reflections induced candide to leave the meadow and to plunge into a wood he supped there with cacambo and after cursing the portuguese inquisitor the governor of buenos aires and the baron they fell asleep on moss on awakening they felt they could not move for during the night the O'Rylons, who inhabited that country, and to whom the ladies had denounced them, had bound them with cords made of the bark of trees. They were encompassed by fifty naked O'Rylons, 
armed with bows and arrows, with clubs and flint hatchets. Some were making a large cauldron boil, others were preparing spits, and all cried, A Jesuit! A Jesuit! We shall be revenged! We shall have excellent cheer! Let us eat the Jesuit! Let us eat him up! I told you, my dear master, cried Cacambo sadly, that those two girls would play us some ugly trick. Candide, seeing the cauldron and the spits, cried, We are certainly going to be either roasted or boiled. Ah, what would Master Pangloss say, were he to see how pure nature is formed? Everything is right, may be, but I declare it is very hard to have lost Miss Cunegonde and to be put upon a spit by O'Reilans. Cacambo never lost his head. Do not despair said he to the disconsolate candide i understand a little of the jargon of these people i will speak to them be sure said candide to represent to them how frightfully inhuman it is to cook men and how very unchristian gentlemen said cacambo you reckon you are to-day going to feast upon a jesuit it is all very well nothing is more unjust than thus to treat your enemies indeed the law of nature teaches us to kill our neighbor and such is the practice all over the world if we do not accustom ourselves to eating them it is because we have better fare but you have not the same resources as we certainly it is much better to devour your enemies than to resign to the crows and rooks the fruits of your victory but gentlemen surely you would not choose to eat your friends you believe that you are going to spit a jesuit and he is your defender it is the enemy of your enemies that you are going to roast as for myself i was born in your country this gentleman is my master and far from being a jesuit he has just killed one whose spoils he wears and thence comes your mistake to convince you of the truth of what i say take his habit and carry it to the first barrier of the jesuit kingdom and inform yourselves whether my master did not kill a jesuit officer it will not take you long and you can always eat us if you find that i have lied to you but i have told you the truth you are too well acquainted with the principles of public law humanity and justice not to pardon us the o'reilans found this speech very reasonable they deputed two of their principal people with all expedition to inquire into the truth of the matter. These executed their commission like men of sense, and soon returned with good news. The O'Reilans untied their prisoners, showed them all sorts of civilities, offered them girls, gave them refreshment, and reconducted them to the confines of their territories, proclaiming with great joy, "'He is no Jesuit! He is no Jesuit!' Candide could not help being surprised at the cause of his deliverance. "'What people!' said he. "'What men! What manners! If I had not been so lucky as to run Miss Cunegonde's brother through the body, I should have been devoured without redemption. But, after all, pure nature is good, since these people, instead of feasting upon my flesh, have shown me a thousand civilities— when then i was not a jesuit end of chapter 16 recording by john van stan savannah georgia chapter 17 of candide by voltaire translated by philip latell this librivox recording is in the public domain arrival of candide and his valet at el dorado and what they saw there you see said cacambo to candide as soon as they had reached the frontiers of the orylons that this hemisphere is not better than the others 
Take my word for it. Let us go back to Europe by the shortest way. How go back? said Candide. And where shall we go? To my own country? The Bulgarians and the Abares are slaying all. To Portugal? There I shall be burnt, and if we abide here we are every moment in danger of being spitted. But how can I resolve to quit a part of the world where my dear Cunegonde resides? Let us turn towards Cayenne, said Cacambo. There we shall find Frenchmen who wander all over the world. They may assist us. God will perhaps have pity on us. It was not easy to get to Cayenne. They knew vaguely in which direction to go. But rivers, precipices, robbers, savages obstructed them all the way. Their horses died of fatigue. Their provisions were consumed. They fed a whole month upon wild fruits and found themselves at last near a little river bordered with cocoa trees, which sustained their lives and their hopes. Cacambo, who was as good a counsellor as the old woman, said to Candide, "'We are able to hold out no longer. We have walked enough. I see an empty canoe near the riverside. Let us fill it with coconuts, throw ourselves into it, and go with the current. A river always leads to some inhabited spot. If we do not find pleasant things, we shall at least find new things. With all my heart, said Candide, let us recommend ourselves to Providence. They rode a few leagues between banks, and in some places flowery, in others barren, in some parts smooth, in others rugged. The stream ever widened and at length lost itself under an arch of frightful rocks which reached to the sky. The two travellers had the courage to commit themselves to the current. The river, suddenly contracting at this place, whirled them along with a dreadful noise and rapidity. At the end of four and twenty hours they saw daylight again, but their canoe was dashed to pieces against the rocks. For a league they had to creep from rock to rock, until at length they discovered an extensive plain bounded by inaccessible mountains. The country was cultivated as much for pleasure as for necessity. On all sides the useful was also the beautiful. The roads were covered, or rather adorned, with carriages of a glittering form and substance, in which were men and women of surprising beauty, drawn by large red sheep, which surpassed in fleetness the finest coursers of Andalusia, Tetuan, and Mechines. "'Here, however, is a country,' said Candide, "'which is better than Westphalia.' He stepped out with Cacambo toward the first village which he saw. Some children dressed in tattered brocades played at quits on the outskirts. Our travellers from the other world amused themselves by looking on. The quits were large, round pieces, yellow, red, and green, which cast a singular luster. The travellers picked a few of them off the ground. This was of gold, that of emeralds, the other of rubies. The least of them would have been the greatest ornament on the mogul's throne. "'Without doubt,' said Cacambo, "'these children must be the king's sons that are playing at quits.' The village schoolmaster appeared at this moment and called them to school. There, said Candide, is the preceptor of the royal family. The little truants immediately quitted their game, leaving the quits on the ground with all their other playthings. Candide gathered them up, ran to the master, and presented them to him in a most humble manner, giving him to understand by signs that their royal highnesses had forgotten their gold and jewels. The schoolmaster, smiling, flung them upon the ground. Then, looking at Candide with a good deal of surprise, went about his business. The travellers, however, took care to gather up the gold, the rubies, and the emeralds. "'Where are we?' cried Candide. 
the king's children in this country must be well brought up since they are taught to despise gold and the precious stones cacambo was as much surprised as candide at length they drew near the first house in the village it was built like an european palace a crowd of people pressed about the door and there were still more in the house they heard most agreeable music and were aware of a delicious odor of cooking cacambo went up to the door and heard they were talking peruvian it was his mother tongue for it is well known that cacambo was born in tucuman in a village where no other language was spoken i will be your interpreter here said he to candide let us go in it is a public house immediately two waiters and two girls dressed in cloth of gold and their hair tied up with ribbons invited them to sit down to table with the landlord they served four dishes of soup each garnished with two young parrots a boiled condor which weighed two hundred pounds two roasted monkeys of excellent flavor three hundred humming-birds in one dish and six hundred fly-birds in another exquisite ragouts delicious pastries the whole served up in dishes of a kind of rock crystal the waiters and girls poured out several liqueurs drawn from the sugar-cane most of the company were chapmen and wagoners all extremely polite they asked cacambo a few questions with the greatest circumspection and answered his in the most obliging manner as soon as dinner was over cacambo believed as well as candide that they might well pay their reckoning by laying down two of those large gold pieces which they had picked up the landlord and landlady shouted with laughter and held their sides when the fit was over gentlemen <laughs> said the landlord it is plain you are strangers and such guests we are not accustomed to see pardon us therefore for laughing when you offered us the pebbles from our high roads in payment of your reckoning you doubtless have not the money of the country but it is not necessary to have any money at all to dine in this house all hostelries established for the convenience of commerce are paid by the government you have fared but very indifferently because this is a poor village but everywhere else you will be received as you deserve cacambo explained this whole discourse with great astonishment to candide who was as greatly astonished to hear it what sort of country then is this said they to one another a country unknown to all the rest of the world and where nature is a kind so different from ours it is probably the country where all is well for there absolutely must be one such place and whatever master pangloss might say i often found that things went very ill in westphalia end of chapter seventeen recording by john van stan savannah georgia chapter eighteen of candide by voltaire translated by philip Littell. this librivox recording is in the public domain what they saw in the country of el dorado cacambo expressed his curiosity to the landlord who made answer i am very ignorant but not the worse on that account however we have in this neighborhood an old man retired from court who is the most learned and most communicative person in the kingdom at once he took cacambo to the old man candide acted now only a second character and accompanied his valet they entered a very plain house for the door was only of silver and the ceilings were only of gold but wrought in so elegant a taste as to vie with the richest the antechamber indeed was only encrusted with rubies and emeralds but the order in which everything was arranged made amends for this great simplicity the old man received the strangers on his sofa which was stuffed with humming-birds feathers and ordered his servants to present them with liquors in diamond goblets after which he satisfied their curiosity in the following terms 
I am now one hundred and seventy-two years old, and I learnt of my late father, master of the horse to the king, the amazing revolutions of Peru, of which he had been an eye-witness. The kingdom we now inhabit is the ancient country of the Incas, who quitted it very imprudently to conquer another part of the world, and were at length destroyed by the Spaniards. More wise by far were the princes of their family who remained in their native country, and they ordained, with the consent of the whole nation, that none of the inhabitants should ever be permitted to quit this little kingdom, and this has preserved our innocence and happiness. The Spaniards have had a confused notion of this country, and have called it El Dorado, and an Englishman, whose name was Sir Walter Raleigh, came very near it about a hundred years ago, but, being surrounded by inaccessible rocks and precipices, we have hitherto been sheltered from the rapaciousness of European nations, who have an inconceivable passion for the pebbles and dirt of our land, for the sake of which they would murder us to the last man. The conversation was long. It turned chiefly on their form of government, their manners, their women, their public entertainments, and the arts. At length Candide, having always had a taste for metaphysics, made Cacambo ask whether there was any religion in that country. The old man reddened a little. "'How, then?' said he. "'Can you doubt it? Do you take us for ungrateful wretches?' Cacambo humbly asked, "'What was the religion in El Dorado?' The old man reddened again. "'Can there be two religions?' said he. "'We have, I believe, the religion of all the world. We worship God night and morning.' "'Do you worship but one God?' said Cacambo, who still acted as interpreter in representing Candide's doubts. "'Surely,' said the old man, "'there are not two, nor three, nor four. I must confess the people from your side of the world ask very extraordinary questions.' Candide was not yet tired of interrogating the good old man. He wanted to know in what manner they prayed to God in El Dorado. "'We do not pray to him,' said the worthy sage. "'We have nothing to ask of him. He has given us all we need, and we return him thanks without ceasing.' Candide, having a curiosity to see the priests, asked where they were. The good old man smiled. "'My friend,' said he, "'we are all priests.' The king and all the heads of families sing solemn canticles of thanksgiving every morning, accompanied by five or six thousand musicians. What? Have you no monks who teach, who dispute, who govern, who cabal, and who burn people that are not of their opinion? We must be mad indeed if that were the case said the old man. Here we are all of one opinion, and we know not what you mean by monks. During this whole discourse, Candide was in raptures, and he said to himself, This is vastly different from Westphalia and the Baron's castle. Had our friend Pangloss seen El Dorado, he would no longer have said that the castle of Thunderton Trunk was the finest upon earth. It is evident that one must travel. After this long conversation, the old man ordered a coach and six sheep to be got ready, and twelve of his domestics to conduct the travellers to court. "'Excuse me,' said he, "'if my age deprives me of the honour of accompanying you.' The king will receive you in a manner that cannot displease you, 
and no doubt you will make an allowance for the customs of the country if some things should not be to your liking candide and cacambo got into the coach the six sheep flew and in less than four hours they reached the king's palace situated at the extremity of the capital the portal was two hundred and twenty feet high and one hundred wide but words were wanting to express the materials of which it was built it is plain such materials must have prodigious superiority over those pebbles and sand which we call gold and precious stones twenty beautiful damsels of the king's guard received candide and cacambo as they alighted from the coach conducted them to the bath and dressed them in robes woven of the down of hummingbirds after which the great crown officers of both sexes led them to the king's apartment between two files of musicians a thousand on each side when they drew near to the audience chamber cacambo asked one of the great officers in what way he should pay his obeisance to his majesty whether they should throw themselves upon their knees or on their stomachs whether they should put their hands upon their heads or behind their backs whether they should lick the dust off the floor in a word what was the ceremony the custom said the great officer is to embrace the king and to kiss him on each cheek candide and cacambo threw themselves round his majesty's neck he received them with all the goodness imaginable and politely invited them to supper while waiting they were shown the city and saw the public edifices raised as high as the clouds the market-places ornamented with a thousand columns the fountains of spring water those of rose water those of liquors drawn from sugar-cane incessantly flowing into the great squares which were paved with a kind of precious stone which gave off a delicious fragrancy like that of cloves and cinnamon candide asked to see the court of justice the parliament they told him they had none and that they were strangers to lawsuits he asked if they had any prisons and they answered no but what surprised him most and gave him the greatest pleasure was the palace of sciences where he saw a gallery two thousand feet long and filled with instruments employed in mathematics and physics after rambling about the city the whole afternoon and seeing but a thousandth part of it they were reconducted to the royal palace where candide sat down to table with his majesty his valet cacambo and several ladies never was there a better entertainment and never was more wit shown at a table than that which fell from his majesty cacambo explained the king's bon mot to candide and notwithstanding they were translated they still appeared to be bon mot of all the things that surprised candide this was not the least they spent a month in this hospitable place candide frequently said to cacambo i own my friend once more that the castle where i was born is nothing in comparison with this but after all miss cunegonde is not here and you have without doubt some mistress in europe if we abide here we shall only be upon a footing with the rest whereas if we return to our old world only with twelve sheep laden with the pebbles of el dorado we shall be richer than all the kings in europe we shall have no more inquisitors to fear and we may easily recover miss cunegonde this speech was agreeable to cacambo mankind are so fond of roving of making a figure in their own country and of boasting of what they have seen in their travels that the two happy ones resolved to be no longer so but to ask his majesty's leave to quit the country you are foolish said the king i am sensible that my kingdom is but a small place but when a person is comfortably settled in any part he should abide there 
I have not the right to detain strangers. It is a tyranny which neither our manners nor our laws permit. All men are free. Go when you wish, but the going will be very difficult. It is impossible to ascend that rapid river on which you came as by a miracle, and which runs under vaulted rocks. The mountains which surround my kingdom are ten thousand feet high, and as steep as walls. They are each over ten leagues in breadth, and there is no other way to descend them than by precipices. However, since you absolutely wish to depart, I shall give orders to my engineers to construct a machine that will convey you very safely. When we have conducted you over the mountains, no one can accompany you further, for my subjects have made a vow never to quit the kingdom, and they are too wise to break it. Ask me, besides, anything that you please. We desire nothing of your majesty, says Candide, but a few sheep laden with provisions, pebbles, and the earth of this country. The king laughed. I cannot conceive, said he, what pleasures you Europeans find in our yellow clay, but take as much as you like, and great good may it do you. At once he gave directions that his engineers should construct a machine to hoist up these two extraordinary men out of the kingdom. Three thousand good mathematicians went to work. It was ready in fifteen days, and did not cost more than twenty million sterling in the specie of that country. They placed Candide and Cacambo on the machine. There were two great red sheep, saddled and bridled to ride upon as soon as they were beyond the mountains. Twenty pack-sheep laden with provisions, thirty with presents of the curiosities of the country, and fifty with gold, diamonds, and precious stones. The king embraced the two wanderers very tenderly. Their departure, with the ingenuous manner in which they and their sheep were hoisted over the mountains, was a splendid spectacle. The mathematicians took their leave after conveying them to a place of safety, and Candide had no other desire, no other aim, than to present his sheep to Miss Cunegonde. Now, said he, we are able to pay the governor of Buenos Aires if Miss Cunegonde can be ransomed. Let us journey towards Cayenne, let us embark, and we will afterwards see what kingdom we shall be able to purchase. End of chapter 18 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 19 of Candide by Voltaire, translated by Philip Littell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. What happened to them at Surinam, and how Candide got acquainted with Martin. Our travellers spent the first day very agreeably. They were delighted with possessing more treasure than all Asia, Europe, and Africa could scrape together. Candide, in his raptures, cut Cunegonde's name on the trees. The second day, two of their sheep plunged into a morass, where they and their burdens were lost. Two more died of fatigue a few days after. Seven or eight perished with hunger in a desert, and others subsequently fell down precipices. At length, after traveling a hundred days, only two sheep remained, said Candide to Cacambo. My friend! You see how perishable are the riches of this world. There is nothing solid but virtue and the happiness of seeing Cunegonde once more. I grant all you say, said Cacambo, but we have still two sheep remaining, with more treasure than the king of Spain will ever have, and I see a town which I take to be Suriname, belonging to the Dutch. We are at the end of all our troubles, and at the beginning of happiness. As they drew near the town, they saw a negro stretched upon the ground, with only one moiety of his clothes, that is, of his blue linen drawers. The poor man had lost his left leg and his right hand. 
good god said candide in dutch what art thou doing there friend in that shocking condition i am waiting for my master mine here van der tender the famous merchant answered the negro was it mine here van der dender said candide that treated thee thus yes sir said the negro it is the custom they give us a pair of linen drawers for our whole garment twice a year when we work at the sugar canes and the mill snatches hold of a finger they cut off the hand and when we attempt to run away they cut off the leg both cases have happened to me this is the price at which you eat sugar in europe yet when my mother sold me for ten patagons on the coast of guinea she said to me my dear child bless our fetishes adore them forever they will make thee live happily thou hast the honour of being the slave of our lords the whites which is making the fortune of thy father and mother alas i know not whether i have made their fortunes this i know that they have not made mine dogs monkeys and parrots are a thousand times less wretched than i the dutch fetishes who have converted me declare every sunday that we are all of us children of adam blacks as well as whites i am not a genealogist but if these preachers tell truth we are all second cousins now you must agree that it is impossible to treat one's relations in a more barbarous manner oh pangloss cried candide thou hadst not guessed at this abomination it is the end i must at last renounce thy optimism what is this optimism said cacambo alas said candide it is the madness of maintaining that everything is right when it is wrong looking at the negro he shed tears and weeping he entered surinam the first thing they inquired after was whether there was a vessel in the harbour which could be sent to buenos ares the person to whom they applied was a spanish sea captain who offered to agree with them upon reasonable terms he appointed to meet them at a public house whither candide and the faithful cacambo went with their two sheep and awaited his coming candide who had his heart upon his lips told the spaniard all his adventures and avowed that he intended to elope with miss cunegonde then i will take good care not to carry you to buenos aires said the seaman i should be hanged and so would you the fair cunegonde is my lord's favorite mistress this was a thunderclap for candide he wept for a long while at last he drew cacambo aside here my dear friend said he to him this thou must do we have each of us in his pocket five or six millions in diamonds you are more clever than i you must go and bring miss cunegonde from buenos aires if the governor makes any difficulty give him a million if he will not relinquish her give him two as you have not killed an inquisitor they will have no suspicion of you i'll get another ship and go and wait for you at venice that's a free country where there is no danger either from bulgarians abares jews or inquisitors cacambo applauded this wise resolution he despaired at parting from so good a master who had become his intimate friend but the pleasure of serving him prevailed over the pain of leaving him they embraced with tears candide charged him not to forget the good old woman cacambo set out that very same day this cacambo was a very honest fellow candide stayed some time longer in surinam waiting for another captain to carry him and the two remaining sheep to italy after he had to hire domestics and purchased everything necessary for a long voyage mynheer van der dender 
captain of a large vessel, came and offered his services. "'How much will you charge?' said he to this man. "'To carry me straight to Venice. Me, my servants, my baggage, and these two sheep.' The skipper asked ten thousand piastres. Candide did not hesitate. "'Aha!' Uh -huh said the prudent Vanderdender to himself. This stranger gives ten thousand piastres unhesitatingly. He must be very rich. Returning a little while after, he let him know that upon second consideration he could not undertake the voyage for less than twenty thousand piastres. Well, you shall have them, said Candide. Aye! said the skipper to himself this man agrees to pay twenty thousand piastres with as much ease as ten he went back to him again and declared that he could not carry him to venice for less than thirty thousand piastres then you shall have thirty thousand replied candide oh, oh said the dutch skipper once more to himself Thirty thousand piastres are a trifle to this man. Surely these sheep must be laden with an immense treasure. Let us say no more about it. First of all, let him pay down the thirty thousand piastres. Then we shall see. Candide sold two small diamonds, the least of which was worth more than what the skipper asked for his freight. He paid him in advance. The two sheep were put on board. Candide followed in a little boat to join the vessel in the roads. The skipper seized this opportunity, set sail, and put out to sea, the wind favoring him. Candide, dismayed and stupefied, soon lost sight of the vessel. "'Alas!' said he, "'this is a trick worthy of the old world.' He put back, overwhelmed with sorrow, for indeed he had lost sufficient to make the fortune of twenty monarchs. He waited upon the Dutch magistrate, and in his distress he knocked over loudly at the door. He entered and told his adventure, raising his voice with unnecessary vehemence. The magistrate began by fining him ten thousand piastres for making a noise. Then he listened patiently, promised to examine into his affair at the skipper's return, and ordered him to pay ten thousand piastres for the expense of the hearing. This drove Candide to despair. He had indeed endured misfortunes a thousand times worse. The coolness of the magistrate and of the skipper who had robbed him roused his collar and flung him into a deep melancholy. The villainy of mankind presented itself before his imagination in all its deformity and his mind was filled with gloomy ideas. At length, hearing that a French vessel was ready to set sail for Bordeaux, as he had no sheep laden with diamonds to take along with him, he hired a cabin at the usual price. He made it known in the town that he would pay the passage and board, and give two thousand piastres to any honest man who would make the voyage with him. Upon condition that this man was the most dissatisfied with his state, and the most unfortunate in the whole province. Such a crowd of candidates presented themselves that a fleet of ships could hardly have held them. Candide, being desirous of selecting from among the best, marked out about one-twentieth of them, who seemed to be sociable men, and who all pretended to merit his preference. He assembled them at his inn, and gave them a supper on condition that each took an oath to relate his history faithfully, promising to choose him who appeared to be most justly discontented with his state, and to bestow some presents upon the rest. They sat until four o'clock in the morning. Candide, in listening to all their adventures, was reminded of what the old woman had said to him in their voyage to Buenos Aires and of her wager that there was not a person on board the ship but had met with very great misfortunes he dreamed of pangloss at every adventure told to him 
this pangloss said he would be puzzled to demonstrate his system i wish that he were here certainly if all things are good it is in el dorado and not in the rest of the world at length he made choice of a poor man of letters who had worked ten years for the booksellers of amsterdam he judged that there was not in the whole world a trade which could disgust one more this philosopher was an honest man but he had been robbed by his wife beaten by his son and abandoned by his daughter who got a portuguese to run away with her he had just been deprived of a small employment on which he subsisted and he was persecuted by the preachers of surinam who took him for a socinian we must allow that the others were at least as wretched as he but candide hoped that the philosopher would entertain him during the voyage all the other candidates complained that candide had done them great injustice but he appeased them by giving one hundred piastres to each end of chapter nineteen recording by john van stan savannah georgia chapter twenty of candide by voltaire translated by philip Littell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. What happened at sea to Candide and Martin? The old philosopher, whose name was Martin, embarked then with Candide for Bordeaux. They had both seen and suffered a great deal, and if the vessel had sailed from Suriname to Japan by the Cape of Good Hope, the subject of moral and natural evil would have enabled them to entertain one another during the whole voyage candide however had one great advantage over martin in that he always hoped to see miss cunegonde whereas martin had nothing at all to hope besides candide was possessed of money and jewels and though he had lost one hundred large red sheep laden with the greatest treasure upon earth though the knavery of the dutch skipper still sat heavy upon his mind yet when he reflected upon what he still had left and when he mentioned the name of Cunegonde, especially towards the latter end of a repast, he inclined to Pangloss's doctrine. "'But you, Mr. Martin,' said he to the philosopher, "'what do you think of all this? What are your ideas on moral and natural evil?' "'Sir,' answered Martin, "'a priest accused me of being a Socinian, but the real fact is i am a manichean you jest said candide there are no longer manichaeans in the world i am one said martin i cannot help it i know not how to think otherwise surely you must be possessed by the devil said candide he is so deeply concerned in the affairs of this world answered martin that he may very well be in me as well as in everybody else but i own to you that when i cast an eye on this globe or rather on this little ball i cannot help thinking that god has abandoned it to some malignant being i except always el dorado i scarcely ever knew a city that did not desire the destruction of a neighboring city nor a family that did not wish to exterminate some other family everywhere the weak execrate the powerful before whom they cringe and the powerful beat them like sheep whose wool and flesh they sell a million regimented assassins from one extremity of europe to the other get their bread by disciplined depredation and murder for want of more honest employment even in those cities which seem to enjoy peace and where the arts flourish the inhabitants are devoured by more envy care and uneasiness than are experienced by a besieged town secret griefs are more cruel than public calamities in a word i have seen so much and experienced so much that i am a manichean 
there are however some things good said candide that may be said martin but i know them not in the middle of this dispute they heard the report of cannon it redoubled every instant each took out his glass they saw two ships in close fight about three miles off the wind brought both so near to the french vessel that our travellers had the pleasure of seeing the fight at their ease at length one let off a broadside so low and so truly aimed that the other sank to the bottom candide and martin could plainly perceive a hundred men on the deck of the sinking vessel they raised their hands to heaven and uttered terrible outcries and the next moment were swallowed up by the sea well said martin this is how men treat one another it is true said candide there is something diabolical in this affair while speaking he saw he knew not what of a shining red swimming close to the vessel they put out the long-boat to see what it could be it was one of his sheep candide was more rejoiced at the recovery of this one sheep than he had been grieved at the loss of the hundred laden with the large diamonds of el dorado the french captain soon saw that the captain of the victorious vessel was a spaniard and that the other was a dutch pirate and the very same one who had robbed candide the immense plunder which this villain had amassed was buried with him in the sea and out of the whole only one sheep was saved you see said candide to martin that crime is sometimes punished this rogue of a dutch skipper has met with the fate he deserved yes said martin but why should the passengers be doomed also to destruction god has punished the knave and the devil has drowned the rest the french and spanish ships continued their course and candide continued his conversation with martin they disputed fifteen successive days and on the last of those fifteen days they were as far advanced as on the first but however they chatted they communicated ideas they consoled each other candide caressed his sheep since i have found thee again said he i may likewise chance to find my cunegonde end of chapter twenty recording by john van stan savannah georgia Chapter Twenty One of Candide by Voltaire, translated by Philip Latell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Candide and Martin, reasoning, draw near the coast of France. At length they describe the coast of France. Were you ever in France, Mr. Martin? said Candide. Yes, said Martin. I have been in several provinces in some one half of the people are fools in others they are too cunning in some they are weak and simple in others they affect to be witty in all the principal occupation is love the next is slander and the third is talking nonsense but mr martin have you seen paris yes i have all these kinds are found there it is a chaos a confused multitude where everybody seeks pleasure and scarcely any one finds it at least as it appeared to me i made a short stay there on my arrival i was robbed of all i had by pickpockets at the fair of saint germain i myself was taken for a robber and was imprisoned for eight days after which i served as corrector of the press to gain the money necessary for my return to holland on foot i knew the whole scribbling rabble the party rabble the fanatic rabble 
it is said that there are very polite people in that city and i wish to believe it for my part i have no curiosity to see france said candide you may easily imagine that after spending a month at el dorado i can desire to behold nothing upon earth but miss cunegonde i go to await her at venice we shall pass through france on our way to italy will you bear me company with all my heart said martin it is said that venice is fit only for its own nobility but that strangers meet with a very good reception if they have a good deal of money i have none of it you have therefore i will follow you all over the world but do you believe said candide that the earth was originally a sea as we find it asserted in that large book belonging to the captain i do not believe a word of it said martin any more than i do of the many ravings which have been published lately but for what end then has this world been formed said candide to plague us to death answered martin are you not greatly surprised continued candide at the love which these two girls of the orylons had for those monkeys of which i have already told you not at all said martin i do not see that that passion was strange i have seen so many extraordinary things that i have ceased to be surprised do you believe said candide that men have always massacred each other as they do to-day that they have always been liars cheats traitors ingrates brigands idiots thieves scoundrels gluttons drunkards misers envious ambitious bloody-minded calumniators debauchees fanatics hypocrites and fools do you believe said martin that hawks have always eaten pigeons when they have found them yes without doubt said candide well then said martin if hawks have always had the same character why should you imagine that men may have changed theirs oh said candide there is a vast deal of difference for free will and reasoning thus they arrived at bordeaux end of chapter twenty one Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter Twenty Two of Candide by Voltaire, translated by Philip Littell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. What happened in France to Candide and Martin? Candide stayed in Bordeaux no longer than was necessary for the selling of a few of the pebbles of El Dorado and for hiring a good chaise to hold two passengers for he could not travel without his philosopher martin he was only vexed at parting with his sheep which he left to the bordeaux academy of sciences who set as a subject for that year's prize to find why the sheep's wool was red and the prize was awarded to a learned man of the north who demonstrated by a plus b minus c divided by z that the sheep must be red and die of the rot meanwhile all the travellers whom candide met in the inns along his route said to him we go to paris this general eagerness at length gave him too a desire to see this capital and it was not so very great a detour from the road to venice he entered paris by the suburb of saint marceau and fancied that he was in the dirtiest village of westphalia scarcely was candide arrived at his inn than he found himself attacked by a slight illness caused by fatigue and as he had a very large diamond on his finger and the people of the inn had taken notice of a prodigiously heavy box among his baggage there were two physicians to attend him though he had never sent for them 
and two devotees who warmed his broths. "'I remember,' Martin said, "'also to have been sick at Paris in my first voyage. I was very poor, thus I had neither friends, devotees, nor doctors, and I recovered.' However, what with physic and bleeding, Candide's illness became serious. A parson of the neighborhood came with great meekness to ask for a bill for the other world payable to the bearer. Candide would do nothing for him, but the devotees assured him it was the new fashion. He answered that he was not a man of fashion. Martin wished to throw the priest out of the window. The priest swore that they would not bury Candide. Martin swore that he would bury the priest if he continued to be troublesome. The quarrel grew heated. Martin took him by the shoulders and roughly turned him out of doors, which occasioned great scandal and a lawsuit. Candide got well again, and during his convalescence he had very good company to sup with him. They played high. Candide wondered why it was that the ace never came to him, but martin was not at all astonished among those who did him the honors of the town was a little abbe of perigord one of those busybodies who are ever alert officious forward fawning and complacent who watch for strangers in their passage through the capital tell them the scandalous history of the town and offer pleasure at all prices he first took candide and martin to la comedie where they played a new tragedy. Candide happened to be seated near some of the fashionable wits. This did not prevent his shedding tears at the well-acted scenes. One of these critics at his side said to him between the acts, "'Your tears are misplaced. That is a shocking actress. The actor who plays with her is yet worse, and the play is still worse than the actors. The author does not know a word of Arabic.' yet the scene is in arabia moreover he is a man that does not believe in innate ideas and i will bring you to-morrow twenty pamphlets written against him how many dramas have you in france sir said candide to the abbe five or six thousand what a number said candide how many are good? Fifteen or sixteen, replied the other. What a number, said Martin. Candide was very pleased with an actress who played Queen Elizabeth in a somewhat insipid tragedy sometimes acted. That actress, said he to Martin, pleases me much. She has a likeness to Miss Cunegonde. I should be very glad to wait upon her. The Perigordian abbe offered to introduce him. Candide brought up in Germany, asked what was the etiquette, and how they treated queens of England in France. "'It is necessary to make distinctions,' said the abbe. "'In the provinces one takes them to the inn. In Paris one respects them when they are beautiful, and throws them on the highway when they are dead.' "'Queens on the highway?' said candide yes truly said martin the abbe is right i was in paris when miss monimay passed as the saying is from this life to the other she was refused what people call the honours of sepulture that is to say of rotting with all the beggars of the neighbourhood in an ugly cemetery she was interred all alone by her company at the corner of the rue de bourgeon which ought to trouble her much for she thought nobly that was very uncivil said candide what would you have said martin these people are made thus imagine all contradictions all possible incompatibilities you will find them in the government in the law courts in the churches in the public shows of this droll nation it is true that they always laugh in paris said candide yes said the abbe but it means nothing 
for they complain of everything with great fits of laughter they even do the most detestable things while laughing who said candide is that great pig who spoke so ill of the piece at which i wept and of the actors who gave me so much pleasure he is a bad character answered the abbe who gains his livelihood by saying evil of all plays and of all books he hates whatever succeeds as the eunuchs hate those who enjoy he is one of the serpents of literature who nourish themselves on dirt and spite he is a folliculaire what is a folliculaire said candide it is said the abbe a pamphleteer a freron thus candide martin and the perigordian conversed on the staircase while watching every one go out after the performance although i am eager to see cunegonde again said candide i should like to sup with miss clairon for she appears to me admirable the abbe was not the man to approach miss clairon who saw only good company she is engaged for this evening he said but i shall have the honor to take you to the house of a lady of quality and there you will know paris as if you have lived in it for years candide who was naturally curious let himself be taken to this lady's house at the end of the faubourg st honore the company was occupied in playing faro a dozen melancholy punters held each in his hand a little pack of cards a bad record of his misfortunes profound silence reigned pallor was on the faces of the punters anxiety on that of the banker and the hostess sitting near the unpitying banker noticed with lynx eyes all the doubled and other increased stakes as each player dogs eared his cards she made them turn down the edges again with severe but polite attention she showed no vexation for fear of losing her customers the lady insisted upon being called the marchioness of pirolignac her daughter aged fifteen was among the punters and notified with a covert glance the cheatings of the poor people who tried to repair the cruelties of fate the perigordian abbe candide and martin entered no one rose no one saluted them no one looked at them all were profoundly occupied with their cards the baroness of thunderton trunk was more polite said candide however the abbe whispered to the marchioness who half rose honored candide with a gracious smile and martin with a condescending nod she gave a seat and a pack of cards to candide who lost fifty thousand francs in two deals after which they supped very gaily and every one was astonished that candide was not moved by his loss the servants said among themselves in the language of servants some english lord is here this evening the supper passed at first like most parisian suppers in silence followed by a noise of words which could not be distinguished then with pleasantries of which most were insipid with false news with bad reasoning a little politics and much evil speaking they also discussed new books have you seen said the perigordian abbe the romance of sieur grachat doctor of divinity yes answered one of the guests but i have not been able to finish it we have a crowd of silly writings but altogether do not approach the impertinence of gachat doctor of divinity i am so satiated with the great number of detestable books with which we are inundated that i am reduced to punting at faro and the melange of archdeacon triblet what do you say of that said the abbe ah said the marchioness of perolignac the wearisome mortal how curiously he repeats to you all that the world knows how heavily he discusses that which is not worth the trouble of lightly remarking upon how without wit 
he appropriates the wit of others how he spoils what he steals how he disgusts me but he will disgust me no longer it is enough to have read a few of the archdeacon's pages there was at table a wise man of taste who supported the marchioness they spoke afterwards of tragedies the lady asked why there were tragedies which were sometimes played and which could not be read the man of taste explained very well how a piece could have some interest and have almost no merit he proved in a few words that it was not enough to introduce one or two of those situations which one finds in all romances and which always seduce the spectator but that it was necessary to be new without being odd often sublime and always natural to know the human heart and to make it speak to be a great poet without allowing any person in the piece to appear to be a poet to know language perfectly to speak it with purity with continuous harmony and without rhythm ever taking anything from sense whoever added he does not observe all these rules can produce one or two tragedies applauded at a theatre but he will never be counted in the ranks of good writers there are very few good tragedies some are idols in dialogue well written and well rhymed others political reasonings which lull to sleep or amplifications which repel others demoniac dreams in barbarous style interrupted in sequence with long apostrophes to the gods because they do not know how to speak to men with false maxims with bombastic commonplaces candide listened with attention to this discourse and conceived a great idea of the speaker and as the marchioness had taken care to place him beside her he leaned toward her and took the liberty of asking who was the man who had spoken so well he is a scholar said the lady who does not play whom the abbe sometimes brings to supper he is perfectly at home among tragedies and books and he has written a tragedy which was hissed and a book of which nothing has ever been seen outside his bookseller's shop excepting the copy which he dedicated to me the great man said candide he is another pangloss then turning towards him he said sir you think doubtless that all is for the best in the moral and physical world and that nothing could be otherwise than it is i sir answered the scholar i know nothing of all that i find that all goes awry with me that no one knows either what is his rank nor what is his condition what he does nor what he ought to do and that except supper which is always gay and where there appears to be enough concord all the rest of the time is passed in impertinent quarrels jansenist against molinist parliament against the church men of letters against men of letters courtesans against courtesans financiers against the people wives against husbands relatives against relatives it is eternal war i have seen the worst candide replied but a wise man who since has had the misfortune to be hanged taught me that all is marvellously well these are but the shadows on a beautiful picture your hanged man mocked the world said martin the shadows are horrible blots they are men who make the blots said candide and they cannot be dispensed with it is not their fault then said martin most of the punters who understood nothing of this language drank and martin reasoned with the scholar and candide related some of his adventures to his hostess after supper the marchioness took candide into her boudoir and made him sit upon a sofa ah 
Well, said she to him, you love desperately Miss Cunegonde of Thunderton Trunk? Yes, madame, answered Candide. The marchioness replied to him with a tender smile. You answer me like a young man from Westphalia. A Frenchman would have said, It is true that I have loved Miss Cunegonde, but seeing you, madame, I think I no longer love her. Alas, madame, said Candide, I will answer you as you wish. Your passion for her, said the marchioness, commenced by picking up her handkerchief i wish that you were to pick up my garter with all my heart said candide and he picked it up but i wish that you would put it on said the lady and candide put it on you see said she you are a foreigner i sometimes make my parisian lovers languish for fifteen days but I give myself to you the first night, because one must do the honors of one's country to a young man from Westphalia. The lady, having perceived two enormous diamonds upon the hands of the young foreigner, praised them with such good faith that from Candide's fingers they passed to her own. Candide, returning with the Perigordian Abbe, felt some remorse in having been unfaithful to Miss Cunegonde. The abbe sympathized in his trouble. He had had but a light part of the fifty thousand francs lost at play, and of the value of the two brilliants, half given, half extorted. His design was to profit as much as he could by the advantages which the acquaintance of Candide could procure for him. He spoke much of Cunegonde, and Candide told him that he should ask forgiveness of that beautiful one for his infidelity when he should see her in Venice. The abbé redoubled his politeness and attentions, and took a tender interest in all that Candide said, in all that he did, in all that he wished to do. "'Oh, so, sir, you have a rendezvous at Venice?' "'Yes, monsieur abbé,' answered Candide. It is absolutely necessary that I go to meet Miss Cunegonde. And then the pleasure of talking of that which he loved induced him to relate, according to his custom, part of his adventures with the fair Westphalian. I believe, said the abbe, that Miss Cunegonde has a great deal of wit, and that she writes charming letters. I have never received any from her said candide for being expelled from the castle on her account i had not an opportunity for writing to her soon after that i heard she was dead then i found her alive then i lost her again and last of all i sent an express to her two thousand five hundred leagues from here and i wait for an answer the abbe listened attentively and seemed to be in a brown study. He soon took his leave of the two foreigners after a most tender embrace. The following day Candide received, on waking, a letter couched in these terms. "'My very dear love, for eight days I have been ill in this town. I learn that you are here. I would fly to your arms if I could but move. I was informed of your passage at Bordeaux, where I left faithful Cacambo and the old woman, who are to follow me very soon. The governor of Buenos Aires has taken all, but there remains to me your heart. Come, your presence will either give me life or kill me with pleasure. This charming, this unhoped-for letter transported Candide with an inexpressible joy, and the illness of his dear Cunegonde overwhelmed him with grief, Divided between those two passions, he took his gold and his diamonds and hurried away with Martin to the hotel where Miss Cunegonde was lodged. He entered her room trembling, his heart palpitating, his voice sobbing. He wished to open the curtains of the bed and asked for a light. "'Take care what you do,' said the servant-maid. "'The light hurts her.' And immediately she drew the curtain again. "'My dear Cunegonde,' said Candide, weeping, "'how are you? 
if you cannot see me at least speak to me she cannot speak said the maid the lady then put a plump hand out from the bed and candide bathed it with his tears and afterwards filled it with diamonds leaving a bag of gold upon the easy chair in the midst of these transports in came an officer followed by the abbe and a file of soldiers there said he are the two suspected foreigners and at the same time he ordered them to be seized and carried to prison travellers are not treated thus in el dorado said candide i am more a manichean now than ever said martin but pray sir where are you going to carry us said candide to a dungeon answered the officer martin having recovered himself a little judged that the lady who acted the part of cunegonde was a cheat that the perigordian abbey was a knave who had imposed upon the honest simplicity of candide and that the officer was another knave whom they might easily silence Candide, advised by Martin, and impatient to see the real Cunegonde, rather than expose himself before a court of justice, proposed to the officer to give him three small diamonds, each worth about three thousand pistoles. "'Ah, sir,' said the man with the ivory baton, "'had you committed all the imaginable crimes, you would be to me the most honest man in the world. Three diamonds!' each worth three thousand pistoles sir instead of carrying you to jail i would lose my life to serve you there are orders for arresting all foreigners but leave it to me i have a brother in dieppe in normandy i'll conduct you thither and if you have a diamond to give him he'll take as much care of you as i would and why said candide should all foreigners be arrested it is the perigordian abbe then made answer because a poor beggar of the country of atrabatia heard some foolish things said this induced him to commit a parricide not such as that of sixteen ten in the month of may but such as that of fifteen ninety four in the month of december and such as others which have been committed in other years and other months by other poor devils who had heard nonsense spoken the officer then explained what the abbey meant ah the monsters cried candide what horrors among a people who dance and sing is there no way of getting quickly out of this country where monkeys provoke tigers i have seen no bears in my country but men i have beheld nowhere except in el dorado in the name of god sir conduct me to venice where i am to await miss cunegonde i can conduct you no further than lower normandy said the officer immediately he ordered the irons to be struck off acknowledged himself mistaken sent away his men set out with candide and martin for dieppe and left them in the care of his brother there was then a small dutch ship in the harbour the norman who by the virtue of three more diamonds had become the most subservient of men put candide and his attendants on board a vessel that was just ready to set sail for portsmouth in england this was not the way to venice but candide thought he had made his way out of hell and reckoned that he would soon have an opportunity for resuming his journey End of chapter twenty two recording by john van stan savannah georgia Chapter twenty three of Candide by Voltaire, translated by Philip Littell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Candide and Martin touched upon the coast of England and what they saw there. Ah, oh, Pangloss, Pangloss, ah, oh, Martin, Martin, ah, oh, my dear Cunegonde, what sort of world is this? said Candide on board the Dutch ship something very foolish and abominable said martin you know england are they as foolish there as in france 
it is another kind of folly said martin you know that these two nations are at war for a few acres of snow in canada and that they spend over this beautiful war much more than canada is worth to tell you exactly whether there are more people fit to send to a madhouse in one country than the other is what my imperfect intelligence will not permit i only know in general that the people we are going to see are very atrabilious talking thus they arrived at portsmouth the coast was lined with crowds of people whose eyes were fixed on a fine man kneeling with his eyes bandaged on board one of the men of war in the harbor four soldiers stood opposite to this man each of them fired three balls at his head with all the calmness in the world and the whole assembly went away very well satisfied what is all this said candide and what demon is it that exercises his empire in this country he then asked who was that fine man who had been killed with so much ceremony they answered he was an admiral and why kill this admiral it is because he did not kill a sufficient number of men himself he gave battle to a french admiral and it has been proved that he was not near enough to him but replied candide the french admiral was as far from the english admiral there is no doubt of it but in this country it is found good from time to time to kill one admiral to encourage the others candide was so shocked and bewildered by what he saw and heard that he would not set foot on shore and he made a bargain with the dutch skipper were he even to rob him like the surinam captain to conduct him without delay to venice the skipper was ready in two days they coasted france they passed in sight of lisbon and candide trembled they passed through the straits and entered the mediterranean at last they landed at venice god be praised said candide embracing martin it is here that i shall see again my beautiful cunegonde i trust cacambo as myself all is well all will be well all goes as well as possible end of chapter twenty three recording by john van stan savannah georgia chapter twenty four of candide by voltaire translated by philip Littell. this librivox recording is in the public domain of paquette and friar giroflet upon their arrival at venice candide went to search for cacambo at every inn and coffee-house and among all the ladies of pleasure but to no purpose he sent every day to inquire on all the ships that came in but there was no news of cacambo what said he to martin i have had time to voyage from surinam to bordeaux to go from bordeaux to paris from paris to dieppe from dieppe to portsmouth to coast along portugal and spain to cross the whole mediterranean to spend some months and yet the beautiful cunegonde has not arrived instead of her i have only met a parisian wench and a perigordian abbe cunegonde is dead without doubt and there is nothing for me but to die alas how much better it would have been for me to have remained in the paradise of el dorado than to come back to this cursed europe you are in the right my dear martin all is misery and illusion he fell into a deep melancholy and neither went to see the opera nor any of the other diversions of the carnival nay he was proof against the temptations of all the ladies you are in truth very simple said martin to him if you imagine that a mongrel valet 
who has five or six millions in his pocket will go to the other end of the world to seek your mistress and bring her to you to venice if he find her he will keep her to himself if he do not find her he will get another i advise you to forget your valet cacambo and your mistress cunegonde martin was not consoling candide's melancholy increased and martin continued to prove to him that there was very little virtue or happiness upon earth except perhaps in el dorado where nobody could gain admittance while they were disputing on this important subject and waiting for cunegonde candide saw a young theatin friar in st mark's piazza holding a girl on his arm the theatin looked fresh colored plump and vigorous his eyes were sparkling his air assured his look lofty and his step bold the girl was very pretty and sang she looked amorously at her theatin and from time to time pinched his fat cheeks at least you will allow me said candide to martin that these two are happy hitherto i have met with none but unfortunate people in the whole habitable globe except in el dorado but as to this pair i would venture to lay a wager that they are very happy i lay you they are not said martin we need only ask them to dine with us said candide and you will see whether i am mistaken immediately he accosted them presented his compliments and invited them to his inn to eat some macaroni with lombard partridges and caviar and to drink some multipolciano lacrime christi cypress and samos wine the girl blushed the theatin accepted the invitation and she followed him casting her eyes on candide with confusion and surprise and dropping a few tears no sooner had she set foot in candide's apartment than she cried out ah mr candide does not know paquette again candide had not viewed her as yet with attention his thoughts being entirely taken up with cunegonde but recollecting her as she spoke alas said he my poor child is it you who reduced dr pangloss to the beautiful condition in which i saw him alas it was i sir indeed answered paquette i see that you have heard all i have been informed of the frightful disasters that befell the family of my lady baroness and the fair cunegonde i swear to you that my fate has been scarcely less sad i was very innocent when you knew me a grey friar who was my confessor easily seduced me the consequences were terrible i was obliged to quit the castle some time after the baron had sent you away with kicks on the backside if a famous surgeon had not taken compassion on me i should have died for some time i was this surgeon's mistress merely out of gratitude his wife who was mad with jealousy beat me every day unmercifully she was a fury the surgeon was one of the ugliest of men and i the most wretched of women to be continually beaten for a man i did not love you know sir what a dangerous thing it is for an ill-natured woman to be married to a doctor incensed at the behaviour of his wife he one day gave her so effectual a remedy to cure her from a slight cold that she died two hours after in most horrid convulsions the wife's relations prosecuted the husband he took flight and i was thrown in jail my innocence would not have saved me if i had not been good-looking the judge set me free on condition that he succeeded the surgeon i was soon supplanted by a rival turned out of doors quite destitute and obliged to continue this abominable trade which appears so pleasant to you men 
while to us women it is the utmost abyss of misery i have come to exercise the profession at venice ah sir if you could only imagine what it is to be obliged to caress indifferently an old merchant a lawyer a monk a gondolier an abbe to be exposed to abuse and insults to be often reduced to borrowing a petticoat only to go and have it raised by a disagreeable man to be robbed by one of what one has earned from another to be subject to the extortions of the officers of justice and to have in prospect only a frightful old age a hospital and a dunghill you would conclude that i am one of the most unhappy creatures in the world paquette thus opened her heart to honest candide in the presence of martin who said to his friend you see that already i have won half the wager friar giroflé stayed in the dining-room and drank a glass or two of wine while he was waiting for dinner but said candide to paquette you looked so gay and content when i met you you sang and you behaved so lovingly to the theatin that you seem to me as happy as you pretend to be now the reverse ah sir answered paquette this is one of the miseries of the trade yesterday i was robbed and beaten by an officer yet to-day i must put on good humour to please a friar candide wanted no more convincing he owned that martin was in the right they sat down to table with paquette and the theatin the repast was entertaining and towards the end they conversed with all confidence father said candide to the friar you appear to me to enjoy a state that all the world might envy the flower of health shines in your face your expression makes plain your happiness you have a very pretty girl for your recreation and you seem well satisfied with your state as a theatin my faith sir said friar giroflet i wish that all the theatins were at the bottom of the sea i have been tempted a hundred times to set fire to the convent and go and become a turk my parents forced me at the age of fifteen to put on this detestable habit to increase the fortune of a cursed elder brother whom god confound jealousy discord and fury dwell in the convent it is true i have preached a few bad sermons that have brought me in a little money of which the prior stole half while the rest serves to maintain my girls but when i return at night to the monastery i am ready to dash my head against the walls of the dormitory and all my fellows are in the same case martin turned towards candide with his usual coolness well said he have i not won the whole wager candide gave two thousand piastres to paquette and one thousand to friar giroflet i'll answer for it said he that with this they will be happy i do not believe it at all said martin you will perhaps with these piastres only render them the more unhappy let that be as it may said candide but one thing consoles me i see that we often meet with those whom we expected never to see more so that perhaps as i have found my red sheep and paquette it may well be that i shall also find cunegonde i wish said martin she may one day make you very happy but i doubt it very much you are very hard of belief said candide i have lived said martin you see those gondoliers said candide are they not perpetually singing you do not see them said martin at home with their wives and brats the doge has his troubles the gondoliers have theirs it is true that all things considered 
the life of a gondolier is preferable to that of a doge but i believe the difference to be so trifling that it is not worth the trouble of examining people talk said candide of the senator pococurante who lives in that fine palace on the brenta where he entertains foreigners in the politest manner they pretend that this man has never felt any uneasiness i should be glad to see such a rarity said martin candide immediately sent to ask the lord pococurante permission to wait upon him the next day end of chapter twenty four recording by john van stan savannah georgia Chapter twenty five of Candide by Voltaire, translated by Philip Littell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The visit to Lord Pococurante, a noble Venetian. Candide and Martin went in a gondola on the Brenta and arrived at the palace of the noble Signor Pococurante. The gardens laid out with taste were adorned with fine marble statues. The palace was beautifully built. The master of the house was a man of sixty and very rich. He received the two travellers with polite indifference, which put Candide a little out of countenance, but was not at all disagreeable to Martin. First, two pretty girls, very neatly dressed, served them with chocolate, which was frothed exceedingly well. Candide could not refrain from commending their beauty, grace, and address they are good enough creatures said the senator i make them lie with me sometimes for i am very tired of the ladies of the town of their coquetries of their jealousies of their quarrels of their humours of their pettinesses of their prides of their follies and of the sonnets which one must make or have made for them but after all these two girls begin to weary me after breakfast candide walking into a long gallery was surprised by the beautiful pictures he asked by what master were the two first they are by raphael said the senator i bought them at a great price out of vanity some years ago they are said to be the finest things in italy but they do not please me at all the colors are too dark the figures are not sufficiently rounded nor in good relief the draperies in no way resemble stuffs in a word whatever may be said i do not find there a true imitation of nature i only care for a picture when i think i see nature itself and there are none of this sort i have a great many pictures but i prize them very little while they were waiting for dinner pococurante ordered a concert candide found the music delicious this noise said the senator may amuse one for half an hour but if it were to last longer it would grow tiresome to everybody though they durst not own it music to-day is only the art of executing difficult things and that which is only difficult cannot please long perhaps i should be fonder of the opera if they had not found the secret of making it a monster which shocks me let who will go to see bad tragedies set to music where the scenes are contrived for no other end than to introduce two or three songs ridiculously out of place to show off an actress's voice let who will or who can die away with pleasure at the sight of a eunuch quavering the role of caesar or of cato and strutting awkwardly upon the stage for my part 
i have long since renounced those paltry entertainments which constitute the glory of modern italy and are purchased so dearly by sovereigns candide disputed the point a little but with discretion martin was entirely of the senator's opinion they sat down to table and after an excellent dinner they went into the library candide seeing a homer magnificently bound commended the virtuoso on his good taste there said he is a book that was once the delight of the great pangloss the best philosopher in germany it is not mine answered pococurante coolly they used at one time to make me believe that i took a pleasure in reading him but that continual repetition of battles so extremely like one another those gods that are always active without doing anything decisive that helen who is the cause of the war and who yet scarcely appears in the peace that troy so long besieged without being taken all these together caused me great weariness i have sometimes asked learned men whether they were not as weary as i of that work those who were sincere have owned to me that the poem made them fall asleep yet it was necessary to have it in their library as a monument of antiquity or like those rusty medals which are no longer of use in commerce but your excellency does not think thus of virgil said candide i grant said the senator that the second fourth and sixth books of his aeneid are excellent but as for his pious aeneas his strong cloanthus his friend achates his little ascanius his silly king latinus his bourgeois amata his insipid lavinia i think there can be nothing more flat and disagreeable i prefer tasso a great deal or even the soprific tales of ariosto may i presume to ask you sir said candide whether you do not receive a great deal of pleasure from reading horace there are maxims in this writer answered pococurante from which a man of the world may reap great benefit and being written in energetic verse they are more easily impressed upon the memory but i care little for his journey to brundusium and his account of a bad dinner or of his low quarrel between one rupilius whose words he says were full of poisonous filth and another whose language was imbued with vinegar i have read with much distaste his indelicate verses against old women and witches nor do i see any merit in telling his friend messenus that if he will but rank him in the choir of lyric poets his lofty head shall touch the stars fools admire everything in an author of reputation for my part i read only to please myself i like only that which serves my purpose candide having been educated never to judge for himself was much surprised at what he heard martin found there was a good deal of reason in pococurante's remarks oh here is cicero said candide here is the great man whom i fancy you are never tired of reading i never read him replied the venetian what is it to me whether he pleads for rabirius or cluentius i try causes enough myself his philosophical works seem to me better but when i found that he doubted of everything 
I concluded that I knew as much as he, and that I had no need of a guide to learn ignorance. Ah, here are fourscore volumes of the Academy of Sciences, cried Martin. Perhaps there is something valuable in this collection. There might be, said Pococurante, if only one of those rakers of rubbish had shown how to make pins. But in all these volumes there is nothing but chimerical systems, and not a single useful thing. And what dramatic works I see here, said Candide, in Italian, Spanish, and French. Yes, replied the senator, there are three thousand, and not three dozen of them good for anything. As to those collections of sermons, which altogether are not worth a single page of Seneca, and those huge volumes of theology, you may well imagine that neither I nor anyone else ever opens them. Martin saw some shelves filled with English books. "'I have a notion,' said he, "'that a Republican must be greatly pleased with most of these books, which are written with a spirit of freedom.' "'Yes,' answered Pococurante, "'it is noble to write as one thinks. This is the privilege of humanity.' In all our Italy, we write only what we do not think. Those who inhabit the country of the Caesars and the Antoninuses dare not acquire a single idea without the permission of a Dominican friar. I should be pleased with the liberty which inspires the English genius if passion and party spirit did not corrupt all that is estimable in this precious liberty candide observing a milton asked whether he did not look upon this author as a great man who said pococurante that barbarian who writes a long commentary in ten books of harsh verse on the first chapter of genesis that coarse imitator of the greeks who disfigures the creation and who while moses represents the eternal producing the world by a word makes the messiah take a great pair of compasses from the armory of heaven to circumscribe his work how can i have any esteem for a writer who has spoiled tasso's hell and the devil who transforms lucifer sometimes into a toad and other times into a pygmy who makes him repeat the same things a hundred times who makes him dispute on theology who by a serious imitation of ariosto's comic invention of firearms represents the devil cannon nodding in heaven <sighs> neither i nor any man in italy could take pleasure in those melancholy extravagances and the marriage of sin and death and the snakes brought forth by sin are enough to turn the stomach of any one with the least taste and his long description of a pest-house is good only for a grave-digger this obscure whimsical and disagreeable poem was despised upon its first publication and i only treat it now as it was treated in its own country by contemporaries for the matter of that i say what i think and i care very little whether others think as i do Candide was grieved at this speech, for he had a respect for Homer, and was fond of Milton. Alas, said he softly to Martin, I am afraid that this man holds our German poets in very great contempt. There would be not much harm in that, said Martin. Oh, what a superior man, said Candide below his breath what a great genius is this pococurante 
nothing can please him after their survey of the library they went down into the garden where candide praised its several beauties i know of nothing in so bad a taste said the master all you see here is merely trifling after to-morrow i will have it planted with a nobler design well said candide to martin when they had taken their leave you will agree that this is the happiest of mortals for he is above everything he possesses but you do not see answered martin that he is disgusted with all he possesses plato observed a long while ago that those stomachs are not the best that reject all sorts of food but is there not a pleasure said candide in criticizing everything in pointing out faults where others see nothing but beauties that is to say replied martin that there is some pleasure in having no pleasure well well said candide i find that i shall be the only happy man when i am blessed with the sight of my dear cunegonde it is always well to hope said martin however the days and the weeks passed cacambo did not come and candide was so overwhelmed with grief that he did not even reflect that paquette and friar giroflet did not return to thank him End of chapter twenty five recording by john van stan savannah georgia